17. Defeat them in detail. The divide and conquer strategy. When you look at your enemies, do not be intimidated by their appearance. Instead, look at the parts that make up the whole. By separating the parts, sowing dissension and division from within, you can weaken and bring down even the most formidable foe. In setting up your attack, work on their minds to create internal conflict. Look for the joints and links, the things that connect the people in a group or connect one group to another. Division is weakness, and the joints are the weakest part of any structure. When you are facing troubles or enemies, turn a large problem into small, eminently defeatable parts. The Central Position One day in early August of 490 BC, the citizens of Athens received word that a massive Persian fleet had just landed some 24 miles to the north, along the coastal plains of Marathon. A mood of doom quickly spread. Every Athenian knew Persia's intentions to capture their city, destroy its young democracy, and restore a former tyrant, Hippias, to the throne, and sell many of its citizens into slavery. Some eight years earlier, Athens had sent ships to support the Greek cities of Asia Minor in a rebellion against King Darius, ruler of the Persian Empire. The Athenians had sailed home after a few battles. They soon saw that this business was hopeless but they had participated in burning down the city of Sardis, an unforgivable outrage, and Darius wanted revenge. The Athenians' predicament seemed desperate. The Persian army was enormous, some 80,000 men strong, transported by hundreds of ships. It had excellent cavalry and the best archers in the world. The Athenians, meanwhile, had only infantry, some 10,000 strong, they had sent a runner to Sparta, urgently requesting reinforcements, but the Spartans were celebrating their moon festival, and it was taboo to fight during such a time. They would send troops as soon as they could, within a week, but that would probably be too late. Meanwhile, a group of Persian sympathizers within Athens, mostly from wealthy families, despised the democracy, looked forward to Hippias' return, and were doing their best to sow dissension and betray the city from within. Not only would the Athenians have to fight the Persians alone, but they were divided into factions among themselves. The leaders of democratic Athens gathered to discuss the alternatives, all of which seemed bad. The majority argued for concentrating the Athenian forces outside the city in a defensive cordon. There they could wait to fight the Persians on terrain they knew well. The Persian army, however, was large enough to surround the city by both land and sea, choking it off with a blockade. So one leader, Miltiades, made a very different proposal, to march the entire Athenian army immediately toward Marathon, to a place where the road to Athens passed through a narrow pass along the coast. That would leave Athens itself unprotected, in trying to block the Persian advance on land, it would open itself to an attack by sea. But Miltiades argued that occupying the pass was the only way to avoid being surrounded. He had fought the Persians in Asia Minor and was the Athenians' most experienced soldier. The leaders voted for his plan. And so a few days later, the 10,000 Athenian infantrymen began the march north, Slaves carrying their heavy body armor, mules and donkeys transporting their food. When they reached the pass, looking down on the plains of Marathon, their hearts sank. As far as the eye could see, the long strip of land was filled with tents, horses, and soldiers from all over the Persian Empire. Ships cluttered the coast. For several days, neither side moved. The Athenians had no choice but to hold their position. Without cavalry and hopelessly outnumbered, how could they do battle at Marathon? If enough time went by, perhaps the Spartans would arrive as reinforcements. But what were the Persians waiting for? Before dawn on August 12th, some Greek scouts, ostensibly working for the Persians, slipped across the Athenian side and reported startling news. Under cover of darkness, the Persians had just sailed for the Bay of Phaleron outside Athens, 
taking most of their cavalry with them and leaving a holding force of some 15,000 soldiers in the plains of Marathon. They would take Athens from the sea, then march north, squeezing the Athenian army at Marathon between two larger forces. Of the Athenian army's eleven commanders, Miltiades alone seemed calm, even relieved. This was their opportunity. As the sun was getting ready to rise, he argued for an immediate attack on the Persians at Marathon. Some of the other commanders resisted this idea. The enemy still had more men, some cavalry and plenty of archers. Better to wait for the Spartans, who would surely arrive soon. But Miltiades countered that the Persians had divided their forces. He had fought them before and knew that the Greek infantryman was superior in discipline and spirit. The Persians at Marathon now only slightly outnumbered the Greeks. They could fight them and win. Meanwhile, even with a good wind, it would take the Persian ships 10 to 12 hours to round the coast and arrive at the Bay of Phaleron. Then they would need more time to disembark the troops and horses. If the Athenians defeated the Persians at Marathon quickly, they would have just enough time to run back to Athens and defend the city the same day. If instead they opted to wait, the Spartans might never arrive. The Persians would surround them, and more ominously, the Persian sympathizers within Athens would probably betray the city from within and open its walls to the barbarians. It was now or never. By a vote of six to five, the commanders decided to attack at dawn. At six in the morning, the Athenians began their charge. By nine in the morning, the Athenians had control of the plains, having lost fewer than 200 men. Although emotionally spent by this battle, the Athenians now had only around seven hours to make the 24 miles back to Athens in time to stop the Persians. There was simply no time to rest. They ran, as fast as their feet could take them, loaded down in their heavy armor, impelled by the thought of the imminent dangers facing their families and fellow citizens. By four in the afternoon, the fastest among them had straggled to a point overlooking the Bay of Phaleron. The rest soon followed. Within a matter of minutes after their arrival, the Persian fleet sailed into the bay to see a most unwelcome sight. Thousands of Athenian soldiers, caked in dust and blood, standing shoulder to shoulder to fight the landing. The Persians rode at anchor for a few hours, then headed out to sea, returning home. Athens was saved. Interpretation Miltiades' plan worked by the narrowest of margins, but it was based on sound and timeless principles. When a powerful foe attacks you in strength, threatening your ability to advance and take the initiative, you must work to make the enemy divide its forces and then defeat these smaller forces one by one, in detail, as the military say. There will be times in life when you face a powerful enemy, a destructive opponent seeking your undoing, a slew of seemingly insurmountable problems hitting you at once. It is natural to feel intimidated in these situations, which may paralyze you into inaction or make you wait in the vain hope that time will bring a solution. But it is a law of war that by allowing the larger force to come to you at full strength and unified, you increase the odds against you a large and powerful army on the move will gain an irresistible momentum if left unchecked. You will find yourself quickly overwhelmed. The wisest course is to take a risk, meet the enemy before it comes to you, and try to blunt its momentum by forcing or enticing it to divide. And the best way to make an enemy divide is to occupy the center. Think of battle or conflict as existing on a kind of chessboard. The chessboard's center can be physical, an actual place like Marathon, or more subtle and psychological, the levers of power within a group, the support of a critical ally, a troublemaker at the eye of the storm. Take the center of the chessboard and the enemy will naturally break into parts, trying to hit you from more than one side. These smaller parts are now manageable, can be defeated in detail or forced to divide yet again. And once something large is divided, it is prone to further division, to being splintered 
into nothingness. Keys to Warfare In 338 BC, Rome defeated its greatest enemy at the time, the Latin League, a confederation of Italian cities that had formed to block Rome's expansion. With this victory, however, the Romans faced a new problem, how to govern the region. If they crushed the League's members, they would leave a power vacuum, and down the road another enemy would emerge that might prove a still greater threat. If they simply swallowed up the cities of the League, they would dilute the power and prestige of Rome, giving themselves too large an area to protect and police. The solution the Romans came up with, which they would later call divide et impera, divide and rule, was to become the strategy by which they forged their empire. Essentially, they broke up the League, but did not treat all of its parts equally. Instead, they created a system whereby some of its cities were incorporated into Roman territory and their residents given full privileges as Roman citizens. Others were deprived of most of their territory, but granted near total independence, and others still were broken up and heavily colonized with Roman citizens. No single city was left powerful enough to challenge Rome, which retained the central position. As the saying goes, all roads led to Rome. The key to the system was that if an independent city proved itself loyal enough to Rome, or fought well enough for Rome, it won the chance of being incorporated into the empire. The individual cities now saw it as more in their interest to gain Rome's favor than to ally themselves elsewhere. Rome held out the prospect of great power, wealth, and protection, while isolation from Rome was dangerous. And so the once proud members of the Latin League now competed against one another for Rome's attention. Divide and rule is a powerful strategy for governing any group. It is based on a key principle. Within any organization, people naturally form smaller groups based on mutual self-interest. The primitive desire to find strength in numbers. These subgroups form power bases that, left unchecked, will threaten the organization as a whole. The formation of parties and factions can be a leader's greatest threat for in time, these factions will naturally work to secure their own interests before those of the greater group. The solution is to divide to rule. To do so, you must first establish yourself as the center of power. Individuals must know they need to compete for your approval. There has to be more to be gained by pleasing the leader than by trying to form a power base within the group. When Elizabeth I became queen, England was a nation divided. The remnants of feudalism entailed many competing power centers, and the court itself was full of factions. Elizabeth's solution was to weaken the nobility by deliberately pitting one family against another. At the same time, she occupied the center, making herself a symbol of England itself, the hub around which everything revolved. Within the court, too, she made sure that no individual, except, of course, herself, gained ascendancy. When she saw that first Robert Dudley and then the Earl of Essex believed themselves her favorites, she quickly cut them loose. The temptation to maintain a favorite is understandable, but dangerous. Better to rotate your stars, occasionally making each one fall. Bring in people with different viewpoints and encourage them to fight it out. You can justify this as a healthy form of democracy, but the effect is that while those below you fight to be heard, you rule. The divide and rule strategy is invaluable in trying to influence people verbally. Start by seeming to take your opponent's side on some issue, occupying their flank. Once there, however, create doubt about some part of their argument tweaking and diverting it a bit. This will lower their resistance and maybe create a little inner conflict about a cherished idea or belief. That conflict will weaken them, making them vulnerable to further suggestion and guidance. The most important thing is to move quickly against your enemies, as the Athenians did at Marathon. Waiting for troubles to come to you will only multiply them and give them a deadly momentum. 
Reversal. Dividing your forces as a way of creating mobility can be a powerful strategy, as Napoleon demonstrated with his flexible system of corps, which let him hit his enemy unpredictably from many different angles. In guerrilla warfare, a commander will disperse his forces to make them harder to hit, but this too demands coordination. A guerrilla army cannot succeed if the parts are unable to communicate with each other. In general, any division of your forces must be temporary, strategic, and controlled.